Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And good morning. Welcome to our online service here for the second Sunday in Easter. We have uh, quite a fruity service today. The Lord himself is going to make fruit of faith grow. And so we're going to let him by that word and receiving it by faith. May it be a blessing to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday of Easter is from Ezekiel, the prophet, chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 John chapter 5. St. John writes, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. 
For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any one, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any one, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, along with Thomas and all of them. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father in his Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Fellow baptized saints, (laughs) it's the night of the resurrection. And while you'd think the disciples would be having an epic party, we find just the opposite. They're afraid, huddling behind locked doors for fear of the Jewish authorities huddling within locked consciences for fear of having deserted Jesus. There's no party, no peace, no joy. All they have is fear. Oh, sure, they've heard the news from the women and a few disciples that he has risen from the dead, but they are weak and slow of heart to believe. And even if he has risen, he's bound to be angry, or so his, their consciences tell them. This is what Jesus has to work with. 
This is how he finds them, finds us. But by the power of his resurrection, he will transform that fear into faith. He wants faith to grow, to blossom and fruit. It's new lifetime, and for this, he comes. You see, throughout Lent, as he headed to the cross, he was fighting for our faith, protecting and defending it from the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, like preserving it through the dark of winter. But here, in the new life of his resurrection, the dawn of the new creation, it's about growth. His resurrection has made the spiritual conditions right for faith to grow and flourish. The season has changed, and now it's time for fruit. The fruit of faith. Fruit that grows up out of his death and resurrection. Fruit in you. Fruit in me. That's what we see here on the night of the resurrection. Christ comes with a sermon that brings peace and joy to a group of terrified disciples. He brings the true fruit of faith, what faith in his resurrection produces in us. And that's what we hope to have him produce in us this morning. Peace and joy. And so we're going to hear him answer two questions for us this morning. What are these two fruits, peace and joy? And how does he produce them in us? How, what are these two fruits, peace and joy? And how does he produce them in us? Peace. It's the first word Jesus speaks to them. When no longer holding back his God power, he appears to them in the locker room and greets them like he'd approach them on the street. Peace be with you. This was the Hebrew way of saying, I want everything to be good for you. But that's what peace is, isn't it? It's when everything goes well, the heart is content, and growth prevails. This is his first word to those who abandoned him, those bent over in fear, those trapped inside themselves. Peace be with you. And no, it's not just his first word. This is always the joyful message Christ brings with him. We heard it three times in our text. He tells them again because they need it. He says it for you. He's not saying it for himself. He says it because you need to hear it. Because you need to know he wants good for you. Your conscience can never be free unless it hears this peace proclaimed again and again. Ah, but this peace of Christ is very secret and hidden from the eyes and the senses. It is not the kind of peace that the world pictures and seeks or that flesh and blood understand. For Christians can never expect any peace from Christ's enemies, that is, from the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. No. <laughs> no. Our sinful flesh remains weak and impatient. The devil still tries to harass and terrify us with our sins. And the world is constant with its persecution and coercion. The peace of Christ is not visible or tangible. It is not made up of bodily feelings, but is an inner and spiritual peace that comes from God, from trust in God, which grasps and holds fast to nothing but what, what it hears in our text, even these gracious words of Christ with which he does, says to all frightened hearts, peace be with you. Don't be afraid. I want everything to be good for you. You see, a Christian is contented and satisfied with having Christ as your dear friend 
and with having a gracious God who desires your constant well-being, even though materially speaking, you have no peace in the world, but constant struggle and conflict. This is the peace Paul proclaims in Philippians chapter 4. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It is the peace Christ promised them in the upper room when he said, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. For the devil, he will not allow a Christian to have peace. That's why Christ must give his peace in a way the world does not. He gives peace on the inside, even in the midst of the insanity on the outside. He enters to quiet the heart, to remove the fears that trap us within, even as the conflict and adversity remain all around us. We see it with his disciples. They're afraid to leave the room. They fear they are up next for torture and death. And even though in their locked room they seem to have peace from those on the outside, their hearts won't stop shaking. And they have no peace or rest. So Jesus comes. He enters in, appears, and stands on the inside to quiet their hearts and bring them peace. Not by removing the danger, no, but by calming their hearts. For nothing has changed on the outside, but within the disciples are changed. They have become courageous and bold, and the animosity of the authorities is no longer a big concern. This is the true peace, which is able to calm the heart, not just in good times, but in the midst of adversity, when on the outside there is nothing but conflict. For here is the difference between worldly and spiritual peace. Worldly peace is about removing the external evils which cause the conflict. As an example, when enemies besiege a city, there's war. But when they are gone, peace returns. Or in the same way, when you're sick or in another physical need, you have peace, you have, or you have no peace. But when it passes, well, peace and rest return. But with Christian peace, this spiritual peace, we find just the opposite conditions. That the evil on the outside remains. Whether adversaries, sickness, poverty, sin, death, the devil, they're always there. They always surround us. Nevertheless, there is inner peace, strength, and comfort in the heart so that the heart does not concern itself with such adversity. In fact, it is even more courageous and joyful in the presence than in the absence of adversity. This is why it can be called true peace a peace which passes all understanding. For reason understands and seeks no other peace except that which the world can give, that which comes from the outside, things like possessions, which can never quiet and comfort the heart in times of need when all else fails. But when Christ comes, he does not change those outward unpleasant conditions, but strengthens the person. He turns a timid heart into a fearless one, a trembling heart into a bold one, a troubled conscience into a peaceful, quiet one, so that the person is courageous, bold, and joyful in the midst of all those things that otherwise terrify the world. This peace is true and constant. It remains forever, is invincible, as long as the heart clings to Christ. This peace is nothing more than that the heart is certain that it has a merciful God and the forgiveness of sins, for without it it can neither stand in the time of need or, and danger, nor be satisfied by any earthly opportunity. This peace 
grows from a true faith in God. Now, we've heard the answer to our first question. What is true Christian peace? But that leads us to our second question. How does he produce it in us? What creates this kind of peace in our hearts? Only the word. Only Christ, who shows us his hands and his side. That is, when he shows us through the word how he was crucified for us. That he shed his blood for us, paying the debt of our sins, reconciling and averting the wrath of God. I mean, this is the only thing that could comfort the frightened conscience and assure us of divine grace and forgiveness. He doesn't show them his healed, glorified wounds to brag, but so they may never doubt, so they may be certain that it is he himself who is not angry with them, but is their dear Savior. Peace be with you. See the wounds. Don't be afraid. I want everything to be good for you. Say the holes in his hands, feet, and side. Here's the proof that I did this for you. For this peace is not so easily grasped by these poor disciples, nor by any troubled consciences, as long as they're terrified and in conflict. So Jesus comes and strengthens them with his word and visible signs. Dear ones, he's still doing this constantly. Not visibly, as with Thomas, but through the voice of the ministry, which he calls us to believe, even though we do not see him, as he blesses in the final words of our text. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You, John proclaims, he did this for you. The whole purpose of John writing the book is so that you would know Jesus did this for you, so that by believing, you may have life in his name. The whole purpose of the ministry of apostles and pastors and preachers is so that you would hear that Jesus did this for you. He did this for you. Preachers are just farm hands, orchard boys, speaking the gospel, so that fruit like peace may grow. Oh, but there are two fruits from his sermon, The Night of the Resurrection, just in case you were wondering what happened to joy. (laughs) Joy is the fruit, that second fruit that grows from Christ's greeting of peace when it is received by faith. As the text says there, did you catch that? Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Glad. For it is indeed the greatest joy that one's heart can experience to see Christ, who was once dead, now declare himself your greatest comfort, your peace and certainty that you have a Savior through whom you've found grace and comfort with God from all terror of sin and death and against the power of the world and hell. You see, that greeting of peace doesn't just tell us that he's risen from the dead, but that we should rejoice in it as our own treasure, that we have peace in every good gift from God. For how can we rejoice in him if we gained nothing from him? No. He wants us to hold him as our comfort and joy. For though his resurrection, for through his resurrection he has conquered all, and gives all that he has done and suffered to us as if it were our very own. Well, no wonder that greeting made them glad. Dear ones, 
we too can rejoice, as his entrance into the lock room shows, that he and his kingdom are no longer bound by bodily, visible, tangible, and worldly things like time and place, but that he is to be recognized and believed upon as the one who through his power can reign everywhere, who can be present with us at all times and all places, when and wherever necessary, and who will help us without being taken captive and hindered by the world and its power. We too can rejoice as he shows that whenever he comes with his rule through his holy word, he does not come with disturbance and commotion, but orderly. He's not changing or breaking anything in the outward affairs of human life and government. He doesn't cause rebellion or revolution against the Roman or Jewish authorities. He simply permits these things to remain in their condition and office as he finds them and he governs Christendom in a way that neither abolishes or weakens orderly government on earth. It's incredible. He does not confuse and displace anything in humanity. Instead, from within, he illuminates and changes our hearts and reason for the better. This is his way. Rejoice and be glad. We need it. And he brings it. The devil, on the other hand, disorganizes and ruins everything orderly on earth through his factions and disturbing spirits, his confusing and noisy servants. They cannot stop their boisterous bombardment in the external and worldly government and life, as well as internally in the hearts of mankind. The devil drives humanity insane and blind by evil preaching, as we can plainly see at any point of human history, including our own. The devil's focus is outward, and he is as loud as possible to keep us from establishing inner peace in Christ. But we don't need to listen to him or his noisy servants. Christ enters into the inner place with his word of eternal peace and joy. Rising, he brings peace and joy with him by a word. What a king! What a kingdom! Well, the disciples aren't afraid anymore. No, they've been sent on a mission. They have a kingdom to proclaim. Their fears have been replaced with peace and joy. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we're going to be including all those that weigh on our hearts and minds, the ones that are in those inner places, knowing that if Christ is there, easing our conscience with his word, creating peace and joy, then certainly he wants to hear about those most inner things so that he can work on them. Let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, in holy baptism, the children of your church are born again to a living hope. Feed and nourish our faith. Bring us through every trial and lend strength and joy to our praises of the risen Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord God of Israel, you sent your spirit upon your people of old and brought them back from exile. Breathe on your church again to renew our faith and fellowship, that we may stand as your holy army. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, give courage to all pastors as they preach and teach the word that all who hear and may believe, and that believing they may live in righteousness and godliness until the day Christ returns as judge and Lord of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Merciful Father, remember those who have wandered from the household of faith. Faithful to your promises, work all things in their lives to remind them of their need for your unending grace and steadfast love that they might return to the faith and delight in your Son, crucified and raised for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you appoint rulers and officials for the sake of order and peace. Bless those you have placed in authority in federal, provincial, and local governments. Give to them the desire to serve with integrity and honor and to work for the benefit of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Lord, as your son's wounds brought gladness and peace to the troubled disciples, give your presence and comfort to the troubled in our midst. Comfort all those who weep with the blessed joy of Easter morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, you gave the testimony of your spirit in the water and blood that poured from Christ's wounded side. Grant that having received this testimony in the water of baptism, we may also receive it in the body and blood of Jesus in this Holy Supper, and so overcome the world by our faith in him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, give us all good things good and beneficial to us and to our salvation, and keep us from all things harmful. Through Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.